This is the story of Dan Air, Flight 1903. On the 3rd of July 1970, a de Havilland Comet was on the way from Manchester Airport to Barcelona Airport. If you don't know the Comet, the Comet was the world's first jet airliner. At the time, the Comet was the cutting edge of what was possible. She made everything that had come before her look outdated. But for the Comet, being on the cutting edge meant that sometimes she got cut. The Comet infamously had design issues that took two planes down, and that led to a redesign of the entire structure of the plane. If you want to see a video about those accidents, then let me know in the comments below. But the story of 1903 is often overlooked and almost forgotten. That being said, if you like the videos that I make, do consider liking or subscribing. It really does help the channel grow. Thank you. On that fateful day, flight 1903 was a charter flight with 112 people on board. The jet took off at 4.08 p.m. and it climbed to its cruising altitude. Before long, they were in French airspace and the French controllers routed the plane through French airspace. It was a bit busy, so flight 1903 had to take some detours. Thus, as it approached Spanish airspace, the plane was a little bit late. The French controllers decided to take them down from 37,000 feet to 22,000 feet. Once the jet had entered Spanish airspace, the pilots were ready to get down to 9,000 feet. Throughout all of this, the pilots of Flight 1903 were in contact with the controllers, letting them know about their estimated arrival times at each waypoint in their route. Once the pilots were in contact with Barcelona Approach, they got an instruction to turn to the left to a heading of 140 degrees. The pilots acknowledged, and like before, they told ATC that they expected to be at the waypoint Sabadell at 6.07 p.m. At 6 p.m., Approach asked the pilots for confirmation that they indeed would be hitting the Sabadell VOR at exactly 6.07 p.m. But things had changed, and the pilots now told them that they would be at the Sabadell NDB at 6.05 p.m., two minutes earlier than expected. So the controller now updated his clearance. The left-hand turn was cancelled, and the pilots now had to proceed directly to Sabadell. As Flight 1903 was getting down to 9,000 feet, the controller inquired if they had DME or distance measuring equipment on board. The Comet did not. The pilots were then cleared down to 6,000 feet and they were instructed to make a left-hand turn to 140 degrees. Let's pause for a second. Why is the controller asking Flight 1903 to turn to the left to 140 degrees? The airport was using ASR-5 radar and they were using the radar in primary mode meaning that they did not have labels on their screen telling them which airplane was who. Instead, they just had a bunch of dots on their screen. To see who was who, the controllers would ask the pilots to make a turn. This way, they could tell who was who. The plane that turns is the plane that you're talking to. This technique is still used today when someone's transponder conks out. I don't know why they had to use this, the Comet was equipped with a Bendix TRA61AL transponder. Maybe the ASR5 that the airport was using was not equipped to receive transponder signals or something. If you know why, let me know in the comments below. Right after this, the controller wanted to know if Flight 1903 was passing the Waypoint Sabadell. The pilot replied with, in about 30 seconds. Just 15 seconds later, they were at the Waypoint Sabadell. The controller said, Radar contact continued to send 2800 feet altimeter 1017 transition level 50. After that, the pilots started thinking about the landing. The pilots wanted to know which was the active runway at the airport, and the controllers wanted to know about the altitude of the plane. The pilot said that they were passing 4000 feet. Just a few minutes later, the controllers tried to reach the plane on radio, but no answer was received. I imagine that the controllers tried again and again, but no reply would ever be received. The search and rescue was immediately started, but nightfall made that hard. The wreck of Flight 1903 was found the following day and the plane was completely destroyed. The jet had flown into the side of Le Aguides at an altitude of 3,800 feet. None of the 112 people on board survived. How did a at the time modern airliner fly into a Spanish mountain as it was attempting to land at one of the busiest airports in Spain? If there was a systemic issue at play here, they needed to find it as soon as possible. Otherwise, thousands of lives would be at risk. The first thing that they looked at were the navigation lights that the pilots were using at the time of the crash. If there were a malfunction, then that would explain the accident. So the investigators decided to look at the Sabadell NDB, the Barcelona VOR, the Perpignan VOR, and the Girona VOR to see if any of them were malfunctioning. And they weren't. Something else brought Flight 1903 down. Now, if this were a modern accident, then the investigators would have a wealth of data from the flight data recorders on the plane. But with this being the 1970s, not a whole lot of data was recorded on the data recorders. 
Only a few parameters were recorded. They were time, speed, altitude, pitch attitude, heading, and vertical acceleration. Only those were recorded. And that too, only for the last eight minutes of flight. This is a far cry from what is possible today, where hundreds of parameters are recorded from the position of the control surfaces to the placement of the throttles and other obscure things that you and I just don't think about. But for the investigators of flight 1903, they would have to make do with the limited amount of data that they had. Looking into the history of this flight, they realized that the reasons for this crash had been set in motion way before the jet ever got near Spanish airspace. The investigators found out that the jet was nowhere near where it was supposed to be. Here's how things were supposed to go. As per the original plans, they would follow the airway Uniform Bravo 31 from French airspace into Spanish airspace, and then they would overfly the Burga waypoint. But for some reason, they were 30 kilometers or about 19 miles to the east of the Uniform Bravo 31 airway. This consequently meant that they would not overfly the Point Burga waypoint as originally planned. Instead, they would pass to the east of Point Burga. From the transmissions made by the pilots, it doesn't appear that they knew that this would be the case because the pilots gave the controllers an ETA of 6.01 p.m. for Point Burga. But with the track that they would be flying, they would never overfly Point Burga. The pilots gave the controllers the time that they would be overflying Point Burga. Instead, they should have given the controllers the time that they would be a beam of Point Burga. This would have let the controller know that flight 1903 was not where it was supposed to be. Based on the flight path, the closest that flight 1903 would get to Point Burga was 26 kilometers. This error then kept piling up. As the flight progressed, the controller wanted to know if flight 1903 was over the Sabadell NDB. You know that the pilots eventually reported that they were passing the Sabadell NDB. But here's the thing, that would have been impossible because the plane never got anywhere near the Sabadell NDB. Here's a quote from the report. At the request of approach, the aircraft reported passing Sabadell without having reached that point. Since it can be observed on the map at Annex 3 that it was still 52 kilometers away. End quote. Yep, you heard that right. The pilots of flight 1903 told the controllers that they were at Sabadell when they were 52 kilometers or 32 miles away from Sabadell. This is so strange because in this situation, the pilots somewhat had to tell their controllers where they were in space so that the controllers knew what to do with them. But it's not like the controllers had no way of double checking what the pilots were telling them. As we know, the controllers at Barcelona had radar. Sure, it didn't have labels and tracks like the radars of today, but you could look at the region where the plane was supposed to be and see if there was a radar track there. It's not perfect by any means, but it's better than nothing. This is where a macabre coincidence kind of happened. The approach controller did check for an aircraft at Sabadell when the pilot said that they were over Sabadell. And when he checked, there was a plane right there, right where he expected one to be. And so he went about his duties. But here's the thing though, that plane that the controller saw at the Sabadell NDB was not flight 1903. We don't know exactly what the radar return was because it was never conclusively identified, but it is possible that the plane the controller saw at the Sabadell NDB was a VFR aircraft at a low altitude. With that, the controller thought that flight 1903 was over the Sabadell NDB, so he cleared them to descend down to 2,800 feet. That altitude would have been safe if the plane had been at the Sabadell NDB, but with where it was, it was a death sentence. It was never really found out why the plane was so off course in the first place. The plane was supposed to be on the airway, but it wasn't. Since we don't have audio recordings of what was happening in the cockpit, it is unlikely that we will ever know what exactly happened to the pilots of flight 1903 in those crucial seconds. The investigators hypothesized that maybe some of the navigational instruments on the plane was malfunctioning, and that's why the pilots made the mistake that they did. Also. If they had just told the controller that they were a beam of Point Burga instead of at Point Burga, then the controller would have been like, wait, that's not where you're supposed to be. Here's what you need to do to get back on course, and all of this would have been averted. To us here in 2023, all of this seems far removed from us and far-fetched because navigation has come a very long way in the last 50 years since this accident. But it's due to accidents like these that air travel is so safe now. Every improvement and regulation that we've made is written in blood. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.